Let's talk about synthesizer knobs. This here is one of my favorite synthesizers, the Korg Monopoly, also known as the MP4. If you do the counting, there are about 42 knobs on there, plus around another 13 analog controls. Here's another one of my favorite synthesizers. This is a Roland JP08, a sort of miniature version of the Jupiter. And if you count, this thing has around 30 knobs, plus a bunch of other controls. Why am I so obsessed with the number of knobs on various synthesizers? Well, it's because if you're a synthesizer designer, like me, then you run into some problems. Let's look at the base station here while I talk. Trying to get as many knobs as you can into your synthesizers. Now you might say, but yeah, these new microcontrollers, they all have tons of analog to digital converters in them. Well, a typical microcontroller probably only has about 16 ADCs. And while that is an awful lot, and you might even find a chip like this, the STM32L496 in the 144 pin package with a total of 24 analog inputs, we just looked at a couple synthesizers that have much more than 16 or 24 inputs. So what is a synthesizer supposed, designer supposed to do? Well, you have to make some kind of analog multiplexer. And so that's what I'm gonna show you today. You see, I'm just extremely excited because I got two packages in the mail. And these packages, which I'm now going to open for you, pertain to an analog multiplexer, which is exactly what you need in order to get more knobs into your synthesizer designs. Oops. Sorry about bumping the camera there. There are some other possibilities, such as having a distributed microcontroller system and sending the knob data over a network, which is totally a valid way to go. In fact, there are a lot of different possibilities to get a whole bunch of knobs into your synthesizer design. Don't you love the way they package this stuff? I give this to my neighbor's cat. And they just love it. They love to scratch it. So, there are, like I said, there are many different ways to do this. I'm going to show you how I decided to do it here. This is a three chip design. Every single one of these circuit boards I'm about to open up has three chips on it. Now, it is not necessarily the most efficient way to do it, it is not necessarily the cheapest way to do it. So, why did I choose to do it this way? Well, I'll tell you, my main criteria was convenience and minimal wiring. You see, some of the ways that you might design these things, you would have a whole bunch of wires inside your instrument. But I wanted something that is daisy chainable. That means you just connect one end of your circuit boards to your microcontroller and you get, this is always so much fun. Uh, first, you got to look at the sticker, Osh Park sticker, very nice. And let's take a look at these circuit boards here. Ooh, look at the focus. Damn, I think you can see where the three ICs are supposed to go. You can also see where you da the daisy chain headers go. You see those six pads right there and those six pads right there? All we have to do is connect this to a microcontroller, then we can connect this to the next board, and that board to the next one. And this circuit here lets you daisy chain up to eight boards together. So every single board, take a look at this one. This shows you how, that there are going to be five knobs on there. You see them? There's the outline. One, two, three, four, five. And if you look really closely, they should be numbered. Well, it looks like it didn't come out right when I designed the circuit board, but hey, this is just the very first iteration, so there's a, supposed to be little numbers on there. Anyway, let me get some knobs and I'll show you how these get packed in there. Oh, that's right, they're in this package here. So I'll keep talking as I open. What I was saying 
is that for this particular circuit board, I want to, from my microcontroller, have as little wires as possible and still be able to access as many knobs and other analog controls as possible through the mag magic of multiplexing. So I set it up so this system literally only requires three signals and we can get 64 analog inputs. How do we do that? Well, the first signal is a reset, the second signal is a clock, and then the third signal is the analog return. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to hit that reset from our microcontroller, and then we're going to keep clock, 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 clocking the other pin, and that's going to lead to us being able to clock in 64 different signals. Now, I know you're saying, isn't that slow? Yes, well, that's one of the trade-offs. But I will tell you something. These days, it's not as slow as you might think. Why is that? Because microcontrollers are getting so darn good. When I started off with microcontrollers a long time ago, reading an analog input was kind of a big deal. You had to do things in, with a in a sort of synchronized way. There weren't necessarily uh, muxes on the chip. So there were a lot of little issues. But things are much more convenient now and the acquisition time of ADCs has gone down very quickly. For example, some of the new Cortex M4 parts can acquire at something like 4 megahertz. So we're talking 250 nanoseconds per analog read. Yeah. If you if it only takes you 250 nanoseconds to read one of these signals, then how long does it take to read 64 of them? So do the math. Every four of them is a microsecond, and then that's 16 microseconds. That means that you could still read at, what, 60? No, 60 megahertz? Is that true? Wait, no. 60 kilohertz. So I can read 60 four knobs at a rate of 64 kilohertz to read the whole entire thing. That is pretty intense. So I don't I don't worry about my design decision to only mux, uh, to mux 64 signals in there. All right, now I'm trying to load these on here and they're falling out. Why? Well, I had to make some design trade-offs. In order to get this n intense knob density, pardon me while I pull this off the floor, if you take a quick look at these knobs, you'll see that these are the main electrical pins here. All right, that's probably not going to focus for us. Anyway, let's look at this. There are these tabs on the side, and those are used for mechanical strength. However, if you were to use those holes on the board, take a quick look here. You'll see, I don't have those because they interfere with the routing. Yeah, with three chips on there, this is dense enough that I really couldn't afford to have those tabs on there. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go get my diagonal cutters. Okay, now I got my diagonal cutters. I'm going to cut these tabs off of these things. Close your eyes. I don't want to get hit in the, in the eye with this. You know what? I don't like these diagonal cutters. They're too bulky. Let me get some smaller ones. I'll be right back. Okay, well, it turns out uh, the, the proper cutters were in my car. and I didn't feel like going all the way there, so I just hacked through it with the big ones. So this is basically what you're going to get. Hold on, let me add the knobs on there. Isn't that pause button just amazing? Anyway, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get these little knobs. And there's going to be headers right there. And one right there that make it so you could read all five of these with just three wires, a clock, a reset, and a ground. Uh, let's see. I'll take a close look at, a brief look at the schematic. So here it is. I don't know how well you could see that, but it basically, here's those two six pin headers, that's where they come in. And you can see it goes into a 4040 chip so this is a 12-stage clock divider. So basically the reset comes in there and the clock. And I use the lower three bits to drive a 4051 analog MUX. 
If you look over here, you can see these are the five pots. They're all wired into this MUX chip, and the, the proper one is selected by this. Meanwhile, the next three bits in the divider actually go to this one of eight selector. So basically what happens is you have to tell every single board which of the eight signals from the 74138 selector is actually going to enable this whole entire thing. That is how the daisy chain works. So on the first board, this zero jumper will be connected up to that jumper by hand. And then as you sit here and clock this, when that Y0 is active low, it's going to enable this whole entire MUX, and then these lower bits clock through, and then that drives this signal here out onto the header. So that's your three signals, clock, reset, and the analog. There's also a voltage, a ground, and one that's unused. Uh, what am I going to do with the unused? I don't know yet. I just kind of left it there because 6 is a nice even number. Um, might make it so you can read two analogs at the same time. I don't really know. But that's, that's the basic outline there. I've got a little bit of soldering to do. If you take a look at the board here, you can see i got to put on three surface mount chips. Then I also need the bypass capacitors and the headers. So I'm going to wire this up, solder it up into a test rig, and then I'll make another video. So thank you very much for watching this far and being interested in this, in this process. And I hope to make like a really super awesome system here that uh, lets you mux a whole lot of analog signals into one place.